Cross-site request forgery. What is it? How does it work? It, cross site request forgery is one of the more common attacks, um, but it's not as understood as SQL injection or cross site scripting, but it is common and widely exploited. So if you're a developer, it's really important that you at least have some understanding of what is cross site request forgery, because that understanding is the only thing that's going to allow you to prevent it. When we think of the internet, we, we think of users and web pages most of the time. And this slide, we see a user on the left side uh, who's interacting with a financial institution. Um, there, it could be their bank, it could be in their investment account. They're interacting with some financial institution. They do this out of convenience. Using the web simpler, this site lets them perform many operations, um, but it's, it's the convenience that really draws them to it. On the right, we have an attacker who wishes to get in between the user and their data, manipulate somehow, but they've been having trouble because they're not on the same network they're, or they're across the world. And so a naive view would say that the attacker really can't do anything because there's this conversation between the user and the bank and the attacker has nothing to do with it. Um, but this is just that, it's a naive view. And it just isn't true and it's important that we understand that. Another thing that's important to understand is the web we have today is not the same web we had 10 or 15 years ago. 10 or 15 years ago we were looking at mostly static content, but today we're looking at dynamic web apps, things that take user content, things that allow the user to perform operations. And in this case, this investment account or this bank uh, provides the user with several important function functions that they can perform on the website. Uh, things such as signing in, signing out, transferring money between accounts, changing their home mailing address, changing their email address, changing their phone number. These are things that you would want to do with your bank. You, if you move, you want to be able to change your address. If, if, you, if you change your email address, you want to be able to change that, or if you get a new phone, and you really don't want to have to go into the bank. So the site provides these, and that's important. The site's no longer just a static web page where everyone sees the same thing. We have this login process. We have things you can do. We have confidential information. We have operations that only you are supposed to be able to perform. And that's really what enables a lot of these attacks. The complexity, the applicationness of websites nowadays, the, that they're no longer static, that they are dynamic, that they interact with you. So one of the things that's very important to understand is how authentication works on the web today. And what happens is when you sign in, the web page or web application, if you will, sends you a cookie. And then for all the future conversation, this cookie is sent back and forth, back and forth between the web browser and the website. And it's this cookie that tells the website who you are and that you are a certain user and that you are signed in. And it's very important. And your web browser knows that this cookie should only be sent to this web app. And that's kind of what keeps it safe, if you will, um, is that it won't send it to other, other websites. If we think back to the earlier slide where you had the attacker on his web page, uh, this cookie is specific to the bank and it wouldn't go to that website. So he can't just take this cookie and send it and your browser just won't send this cookie to him. Um, and so it would seem to be a, a rather foolproof mechanism. When you browse to his site, your co that cookie stays on your machine. It doesn't get sent over. Um, but what he can do is he can put something on the page. And in this case, if we take a closer look at that page, he's put instructions for your browser. And in these instructions, these are would normally be in the form of JavaScript or some AJAX. He's saying, tell the bank, the, the bank site we saw before, to change the email address to hackrs.com, hack at rs.com. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, he, he can't just do this. And that and that's that's right, he can't just make this request. But what he can do is he can hand to your computer a bit of JavaScript. Uh, which your, your computer will run. And since you're already logged into the bank, it will make the request on your behalf and it will send the cookie. 
because it was told that it should make this request. And you may look at this and say, this is a really bad thing. Why do browsers allow this? Why don't they prevent this? And it is a really bad thing. But the problem is much of the internet is built on this bad thing. When we look at the Facebook like buttons, when we look at the Google Plus buttons or the um, Twitter buttons or the dig buttons, many of those are built off of the same principles that enable this attack. And to cripple this attack from the browser's perspective is to cripple those buttons, those things that glue the web together and make it work, the single sign-ons. All of that is built on this the same technology. So we can't just disable that the browser. And what's also important to note here is the browser will honor what it was told to do. In this case, it made the change email request to the, the bank. And because this bank did not think about cross-site request forgery, it honored it and changed the user's email address to now be hacksrus.com. And this is, this is very bad. This all happened without the user knowing. The user this entire time thought they were on the cow website. They, they were there the entire time. Uh, no pop-up windows opened. None of that. It, they were there the entire time. It was all done in the background without their knowledge. So let's take a look at how we can prevent this. So fundamentally, right now, uh, when you think of a web app or web application, you think of a web app and a cookie. The cookie tells you who who the user is, and you use that to invalidate their sessions and do all sorts of things. It's, it's how you track identity. But it's not enough because you have those APIs exposed that we discussed previously, the login, the logout, the, the change email address. All of those are wide open. If this cookie is sent, they, they are honored. So what we need is some way to ensure that that initial request was sent from our page or was sent by someone who has read access to our page. Because in this scenario, um, because you're just browsing uh, to the attacker's website, they can't access the contents of the cookie. And while they can make the tell your browser to make the request, it's your browser making the request. And it's your browser that gets the response. The attacker's website can't get at the response. So they're really just shooting in the dark. But it works if you get millions of users a day, or if you send targeted emails with links to sites that are targeted specific users who you suspect use an application, it can be very effective. Um, so how do we prevent it? Like I said, we need to somehow ensure that all the requests come from something that has access to the page, the page itself, the data contained in the page. And this will ensure that the request was made by a user who's actually looking at our page, looking at our web app, um, and not by a user who's looking at a different web app. So one of the easiest ways to actually do this is to just put a token in the page. And often this token will be in the form of a hidden field on, the, on a form or um, just some hidden field in the page that JavaScript has access to. So when it's making an Ajax request, it, if you're, your web app is Ajax heavy, it can include this token with that, those Ajax requests, those Ajax postbacks. Um, and this token lets the web server know that your browser is on or in your web app, at the web app um, at that time. It's on some other site um, who's just shooting this request out. So how does that work, though? Um, that, that still doesn't make that much sense, right? And so basically, um, what happens most of the time is this token is some encrypted value. And it's encrypted with a key that only the web server knows. So the client, the user, the browser, none of them actually know what the cookie says underneath the encryption. Um, they can just see the encrypted data. And if they mess with it, it won't decrypt properly. Now, that's not enough either, because if if everything just has the same encrypted value, all the attacker has to do now is browse your website, get a valid encrypted value, and put that in his request, and his requests work. And so clearly that's not enough. And to fix that problem, this token or encrypted value that's on the page is specific to the user somehow. And even better is if it's 
specific to the user's current session. And what this means is that every user or every session has a different token. And the token doesn't even have to be stored on the, the website because the website, the web server side, has the decryption key that it can use to decrypt that token and verify that is indeed a correct token. So one way to do this is to just say encrypt the, the session ID with uh, some salt, some random value. And this will help prevent reversing of the key, um, which should be impractical anyways, um, as long as you're using an AES key of large enough size. Um, but just something like that, just some, some way to uniquely identify a user or a user session, uh, put that on the page, and it should be included with all requests. If you put it as a hidden field on a form, um, you can pick it up there and validate it there. Now, many frameworks and, and technology stacks like uh, MVC, Microsoft's MVC, or Ruby on Rails have these mechanisms built in. In the case of Ruby on Rails, it's enabled by default. Um, but in the case of Microsoft's MVC, you have to turn it on yourself. You have to add it. And so if you're developing a web app, you should really look into your, your application frameworks, um, cross-site request forgery prevention mechanisms. Most of them should have something built in. If they don't have something built in, you should probably reconsider your web development framework because these are the problems that are hard and these are the problems that you want your framework to help you with. But if you're really set on your framework or you invest a lot, you can write your own. Um, and it's just important to keep this in mind. I would definitely go grab yourself a book on cryptography. Um, Bruce Schneer is a great one. Or read some, look at some implementations in other languages. Like I said, Rails is all open source. You can look at their implementation. Um, MVC4 is now open source. Uh, so if you can't find that today, you should be able to find uh, that soon. And you can look at those and use those as guidance. But back to how this works. So since the attacker can't get at the content of the page, but your local JavaScript can, it can put this token in every good request, and there's something on the server, um, if you're using one of the frameworks, that built-in thing, or if you had to roll your own, your open, you rolled in stuff that looks for this token as part of the request, as part of the post. And if it's there, it processes the post. If it's not there, uh, it does not process the port post and probably just labels it as a, an attack, probably throws an error on maybe a 402, or, or, sorry, 401 or 500 or some error just to say, hey, I'm not processing this. This looks suspicious. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna actually honor that request. Now, so far I've only talked about posts. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, I have a lot of these things in my app, but they're all, they're all gets, they're all links that users click. And what I'd say to that is, that's bad. Don't do that. And the reason why you don't want to do that is because according to the HTTP specification, uh, git is what's considered a safe method. And that means it should not have any significant uh, side effects or not take any significant action besides the retrieval of data. If it does more than that, if you're using a, a get request to log users off or if you're using a get request to, ch to change email address or delete an entry or add an entry or any of those things, stop. Don't do it. That's what post is for. I know post is, is somewhat frowned upon um, because it really got overused by ASP.NET and things like that where they turned everything into a post and that wasn't right either. There's a happy place for both of those. Gets are used for retrieval. Posts are used for changing stuff. And cross-site request forgery really only applies to things changing stuff. So it only applies to posts. Assuming your website actually follows the guidelines of the HTTP specification. If it doesn't, you may have to include this token on all gets. And that may be hard. Um, you, it, it makes it more difficult and it's, it's, you're doing it wrong. So with it on your posts, um, you, with your forms, it'll be auto submitted. If you're using Ajax, scrape it out there, put, put in your JSON objects that you're sending back, um, and make sure your web server is checking for it. And so this is important too. I found out recently, MVC4, if you use the a API controllers that Microsoft provides, uh, there's not a cross-site request forgery prevention mechanism that works with those. Um, and the only way I, I found this out was by testing it. And that's 
that's really important. Test your applications. And a way to test this is to modify the token in the browser to an invalid token. And what should happen is you should click the link or from the action you want to perform. And since there's an invalid token in there now, the, the request should not be honored. And if the request is not honored, um, then, then your website's working. Then, then you are preventing cross-site request forgery, most likely, um, unless your tokens are completely predictable. But that is cross-site request forgery in a nutshell. Um, comment, review, uh, leave leave questions. I will try to get back to them. Uh, if there's a lot, maybe I'll try to do a second video. Um, but thanks for your time. And please, if you're building a website, put in these mechanisms um, because your users have almost no way to protect themselves from cross-site request forgery attacks. It is up to you, the developer to protect your users from cross-site request forgery attacks by building the protection mechanisms into your website.